gets the go-ahead. All the professional bat and ball crowd are way down south for spring. In this case, it's the New York Yankees reporting for play at St. Petersburg, Florida, with new manager Casey Stengel ready to out Casey the field. Catcher Yogi Berra and coach Bill Dickey have the right idea. No winter storytelling here, but signals for certain service in the summer. Of particular interest in the Yankee lineup is slugger Charlie Keller, hoping for a comeback. But a special case is an inflamed right heel of the highest paid Yank of them all, Joe DiMaggio. With his foot in good shape, the Yankees are dangerous. But everywhere, the boys are setting their caps, hopes, and tricks for the season. Spring and baseball are coming, right, Mr. Stengel? You bet. In Calvary Cemetery, New York's largest Catholic burying ground, a cardinal takes over the grave digging. With the regular custodians striking for a 40-hour, five-day working week at existing wages, a thousand bodies have awaited burial in the past seven weeks. Six hundred have been temporarily interred in a common grave. After negotiations with the grave diggers' union were broken off, Francis Cardinal Spellman recruited 100 seminarians to prepare the graves. The young candidates for priesthood dig efficiently through the frozen ground, and the Cardinal says they will continue their work until all burials are completed. Although union spokesmen emphatically deny the charge, Cardinal Spellman denounces the grave diggers' union as communist-dominated. first airplane to fly around the world non-stop comes into Carswell Air Base in Fort Worth, Texas. A B-50 Superfort of the 8th Air Force, she's called Lucky Lady II. Her 14-man crew, headed by Captain James Gallagher, is greeted by Air Secretary Symington, General Vandenberg, and top men of the Air Force. After 23 and a half thousand miles without a landing, they rate a reception like this. Now the log of the globe-circling flight. From its beginning, the historic hop was wrapped in secrecy. The Air Force called it just another training flight. Few people knew that it was a major step in the Air Force's concept of worldwide air power, that an epic mission was in the making after a routine takeoff from Fort Worth. Roaring eastward, the plane headed for a rendezvous in the sky above the Azores, 3,800 miles away. And here, the means for the ultra-distance magic were first employed. B-29 tanker planes met the lucky lady to transfer fuel in mid-air. Flying gas stations that make possible flights to any point on the globe. From the Azores, the lucky lady's tremendous non-stop journey became history. Now safe at home after 94 hours in the air, Captain Gallagher and his world-circling airmen received the thanks and good wishes of Air Secretary Symington. I want to congratulate you very much, not only for the Air Force, but for the whole United States. This is a wonderful job. The President asked me to congratulate you and send you his best wishes. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. monarch in heavyweight boxing history. Joe Lewis, the fighter with an atom bomb in each fist, retires undefeated just shy of his 35th birthday. He makes official a statement on his retirement, dating back to his last defense of the title in June 48. I've defended my championship 25 times. I think uh, uh, I've been told to, to retire now. Acclaimed by his race and by legions of sports followers, the bomb arose from sharecropper days in Alabama and Detroit slums to fistic greatness. From 1934, when his professional career began, Joe's lethal fists carried him rapidly up the pugilistic ladder. In June of 37, he KO'd champion Jimmy Braddock. Only 23, he became the youngest fighter ever to win the heavyweight title. And Lewis went on to defend the championship more times than anyone before him. 25 bouts, 21 KOs. The war saw Lewis volunteer for duty. As a GI, he toured camps, putting on boxing shows. 
And in September 45, Tech Sergeant Joe Lewis received the Legion of Merit for exceptionally meritorious conduct. Back in ring warfare, Lewis met challengers including Jersey Joe Walcott, whom he beat twice as a finale to his career. Walcott remained the leading contender, and today as Lewis turns promoter, he immediately matches Walcott with Ezard Charles, the winner to be the new heavyweight title holder. Walcott is exclusively interviewed for Paramount News. Jersey Joe, how do you feel about your match with Ezard, Ezard Charles? Well, I'm very happy about it. I'm very happy to think that the NBA and the Ring Magazine selected me as the number one man, and, and I'm very proud of Joe Lewis for, for uh, arranging the match for Charles and I to fight for the title. In Cincinnati, Ezard Charles, fresh from a victory over Joey Maxim, also comes before our camera to tell the fighting public... If I should be successful in winning the championship, I shall do all that's in my power to, to prove to the people that, that I'm worthy of becoming the champ. But there are others who want in on the vacated title. Here's Lee Savold, who may get a chance against the Walker Charles winner. Savold apparently is ready right now. Anybody that wants to become the next heavyweight champion of the world will have to be defeat me. And I personally think that you're looking at the next heavyweight champion right now. No matter who the future champs may be, none can erase from the memory of this sports generation the spectacle of Joe Lewis, the masterful ground bomber at his fighting peak. Skilled as a boxer with dynamite in either hand, Lewis fought with the fury his profession demanded. From the Golden Gloves to fame and riches, the success story of Joe Lewis, undefeated retired heavyweight champion of the world. <laughs>